Hey everybody, Jeff Manchester here. In this video, I'm going to show you a particular cue that I've just completed for a, a feature film by two very talented Alberta filmmakers for a movie called On the Rocks. I'm going to show you how I made it. We're going to listen to it. And uh, yeah, and then I'll just sort of dive into the guts of it. And hopefully this video will give you guys an idea of how a cue for a feature film or any kind of media gets made. Um, I'm doing this because there's been some interest on Twitter for me to show you, you know, the guts of a cue. And I did a video kind of like this earlier, but it was more about delivering stuff to clients and what goes into a queue and how it's exported and all that jazz. So you can check that video out. I'll leave a link to it on the screen. But for today, um, very quick queue. It's only about two minutes and 15 seconds long. And as I said before, on the rocks, I'm just gonna play the queue through from start to finish, and then I will get into it with you. And um, yeah. Okay, so the first thing to know is that these cues aren't composed in a vacuum. They are the result of um, consultation between the composer and whoever it may be on the other end, whether it's the director or whatever. In this case, it was there, there's two people involved in On the Rocks, mainly. There's many people involved, but the people at the top, um, in this case, are the director and um, the editor slash um, DOP. So this cue came about... Uh, as a result of you know specific instruction and also there's tons of context going on in here I know you can't see much of the footage and I flashed it just for a moment to prove that it is <laughs> for a movie but uh, if festivals uh, see footage on YouTube or anywhere else before um, the film is submitted to, uh, submitted to a festival or anything like that people can get in trouble so I'm trying not to show any footage but I think music is fair game at any rate uh, yeah, so just gives you some context. So the stuff that happens before this moment in the film uh, informs the sound, and certainly the things that are going to happen after this film cue uh, definitely inform the sound. So plot and instruction from uh, the people at the top who are making the film, and you know it goes through a bunch of edits. That's what you're hearing now. Is you're hearing the completed sort of agreed upon sound. So I just want to make that clear. But now, getting to the music stuff. Unfortunately, I've I've frozen some stuff here. I had some MIDI. Everything was MIDI, by the way. But um, I froze things down. And unfortunately, you can't see the exact MIDI notes that I was using before. But I've tried to recreate uh, some of the MIDI that I used. But I have all the instruments there. And you can see everything that I used. And I'll get into it in, in some detail. But yeah, this isn't a totally faithful representation of everything that was happening in the queue before it was bounced out. That being said... 
Let's start at the bottom. So I'm using two instances of Spitfire's Evo strings, and that looks like this in here. Let's open up Contact. There we go. So we have Evo strings. Really fun little Peggy system. It's just basically a, a legato sort of string sample library. I really like it because I love big beds of sound, and I find it's very hard to program beds, kind of washy beds of strings or brass or what have you, using, for example, the, the orchestral pack that comes in Ableton Live. So I really like the Evo strings. If I just arm this track and turn this channel on and put my fingers down, let's say on C major, you can hear what, what happens. So it's gonna, it's called Evo because these things evolve, right? So you can see that we're building up to a kind of crescendo. Put your foot down on the sustain pedal. Okay, you can get kind of crazy with it, but what I've done is I've, I've, I've played some stretches of sounds using this Evo strings, two instances of it, and um, they follow the main melody that I came up with. And again, getting back to this sort of, you know, consultation between the director and all this stuff, they had some reference music for me, and I came up with a cue, a sort of a backbone, a skeleton for this track using the reference track that they sent to me. And the melody that I came up with for that, you'll hear here in the strings section. I'll just play it for you on the piano here. This is Ableton's grand piano. I use this sometimes. Arm this piano track. Um, the main chords that you were hearing at this moment here, if I play it for you. This is guiding the track, this melody. Just triads, because that's all music is anyway, just a bunch of triads. But in our case, it's C, C major, E major, up to A major, and down to D minor, and then back to C, back to E, and we'll switch, we'll go to D minor this time and then up to A. Okay, and that's it. That's really the backbone of this melody. And something I want to point out here, it's all about simplicity. I mean, I as a composer, you know, I get asked to make all kinds of different music, but I, I have to say, the people who are running sessions like this and whatever DAW, the, DAW they're using that have, you know, 70 plus MIDI tracks and all the rest of it, that's okay because sometimes a film requires that but you know i'm someone that listens to like the penguin cafe orchestra and you know string quartets and chamber music it's very simple stuff i don't think you have to max out your cpu in order to hit someone you know in the heart i don't think you have to really shove music down their throats i have a kind of emotionally allergic reaction to a lot of the Hans zimmer stuff i'm really happy he's getting out of superhero movies because, you know, a film score should support the action on screen. It shouldn't take over from it. And if you, you know, if you watch Inception or whatever, we all remember those big sort of brass impact. You know, it's almost a cliche at this point. And a, the movie, the action, was doing a lot of the talking. You as a composer, you want to support what's happening on screen. If you can get away with it, try and restrict yourself. Look at this session. I've got, if we don't include this, uh, this top file, this is really the film file that says audio. I've got some strings, I have some um, clarinets and woodwinds here, and then I have vocalized, which I'll talk about in a minute, and I've got two instances of Evo strings. Now some of you might say, well you don't have 60 MIDI tracks, but those Evo strings, that's like a 20 piece string orchestra, and it is, because you do need that depth, but what I'm saying is you don't have to max out your CPU and use every friggin' instrument that you have in your arsenal in order to affect someone, or make them cry, or put a lump in their throat, you don't need to, so don't feel you know, like you, you, you can't really move people unless you spend 
20 grand in east-west instruments and all the rest of it. That's all I'm trying to say. So with Evo, with the strings, let's start from the bottom here. I have a main melody playing, which I've frozen and bounced down, so it's just going to be audio. This is just a bed of sound, just a wall, a curtain of strings. And in this case, I've recreated it down here. If I open up contact, how I did that was I just had my fingers down on the A. I hit my sustain pedal and go up an octave. And I might hit some of those other notes that are within um, this mode, which I believe is C minor. And I'll just let that ring out. I'll just let that play out. And I'll let that play for the, for the duration of the cue. And one thing that I did, you'll see that I've got two instances of Evo here. One and two. Let's listen to this one. Let's hear what it's doing. This is the higher register. This is everything past middle C, C3. And then I've got here, I've got the exact same MIDI information. I've just lowered it an octave. And I do this a lot. And I also make it much quieter. Now I've also got big servings of reverb. I have I put two reverbs on these strings, and they're going to send send A and C. Let's take a look at what I have on send A. I have Ableton's reverb, nothing fancy. The dry wet's all the way at 100%. I've done a little high cut here. And on send C, so do you guys know what I'm doing here? Uh, this is send A. I can lower and, and raise the amount of reverb. And then on send C, I can do the same thing here. And I have send C going to, excuse me, sorry guys. I have send C going to a convolution reverb, which comes with Ableton Suite. And I just got it on the first preset here. It's a giant basilica, it's called. So you can hear what it sounds like when I take away the reverb. Now we're going to bring it back in. So it just gives it a kind of depth. It's like we're reaching into the track. And that's what you want, I think, when you're, when you're making the sort of bed tracks, the sort of tracks that are going to hang out in the background and support some of the main melodies. So that's all I did was I made the first a bit of MIDI information with um, with Evo, and I put it past middle C, past C3. If I solo this. Okay, and then I duplicated this track by highlighting it and hitting Command D. It's going to duplicate everything. And I click on the notes, and if I move this, I can see all the notes here. I'm going to fold down just so I can see the notes that I've... Okay, that's it. And then I just... I hit Command A and I highlight them and I'll go over to my notes here. I'll click on this and I'll hold Shift and hit the down arrow. And that's going to knock them down an octave. So it's the same notes, but we're knocking them down past middle C. I'll hit it again. We're going even further down middle C, down on the keyboard. So now that I have those two there, I'll apply some big scoops of reverb to both of them. And I'll make sure they're not the same volume because if you duplicate something, it's going to go up in, by 6 dB. Okay, so you want to control for that. Go back here. So now it sounds just, it, it's filled out. And you can get even further with this, which I believe I did, by splitting these up in the panning right here, okay? So I can send some of these to the left and some of them to the right, because an orchestra would be split up anyway, right? play them back. Now one thing I do sometimes is if I'm using strings and I'm separating them by tone, so higher frequencies and lower frequencies, I'll go a step further to make sure that those tones are separated by applying an EQ on them. So I'll put an EQ there, and 
I'll put an EQ there, oh, there. If I go in here, what I'll do is I'll high pass these strings. So that no low end information is competing with the strings at the bottom end. Give a little bump here. And I'll go in and I'll high pass these. I'll do the opposite of that. so that no high-end information is going to compete with the strings at the top here, or at least very little. I just want the kind of gooey, sad tones coming from the lower register. This is all, again, this is all like to taste, right? You're making a recipe and you're like, ah, I think it needs more salt, put more salt, even if the recipe doesn't call for it. And, you know, the guiding philosophy is if it sounds good, it is good. I'm just going to get rid of these. Now let's move up the list to vocalize. That's Those are those sort of kind of angelic siren style voices. And this comes from an instrument made by Heaviosity. If I pull up contact, we can see it right here. And this is a, it's got phrases, it's got pads, and all the rest of it. Um, I use it a lot. You should use stuff like this sparingly. You don't want to overwhelm. It might sound good to you when you're like making the cues yourself. You got all these voices coming in and out and stuff, but it, it can be a little much, especially if you're composing for film, because then it just, it. I've done it before. I've had people tell me like, eh, maybe take one or two of those voice, voices out. And I'm like, it sounds great. And I listen back and I'm like, yeah, it is a little indulgent. So don't be indulgent with this kind of stuff. Um, that's gravity. I don't want that. I want heaviosities vocalize, which is probably somewhere up here. I have to organize all this, but there we are. Yeah, so it's a phrase menu, and I've made sure that it's uh, we're in A minor, which is consistent with our C minor key. And if I press down on any of these, I'm going to make sure that I solo the track. If I press down on the keys, the tone is beautiful. Okay, now I've done this, I won't show you the film, but I've, I've, I've used this instrument, I've applied some MIDI right at the moment where we see the character's face, Grace, the, one of the main characters, just to sort of accent her walking into the frame. It's very effective um, and very emotional. So use these kind of tracks sparingly and use them at you know key moments within uh, the film, you know, action, whatever like that, use them in the moment. And uh, you'll know what's happening right here. You'll see it because you've lined it up perfectly. You've got the MIDI information. And when I see I've got this little marker here, walks into the frame. Um, and it'll kind of be obvious to you, but to someone who's never heard the music or seen the film, when it happens, you know, it's, it's, it's a really neat little trick. And um, it hits people. So vocalize. I haven't done too much work here. I've applied some reverb. I've sent again. Just some reverb here to our convolution reverb, which is down here. And I've also panned it to the right just a little bit. If I switch over to my mix window, vocalize right here, I panned it a little bit to the right. And you'll also notice that none of my faders are like at zero. I'm always going lower than that because I want to make sure I have a lot of headroom on the master if I want to go and master this stuff. Or if I'm sending it off to a music director or an editor or whatever, I'm not going to max this out and then give him no headroom to work with if he wants, if let's say the, the composers get there or the uh, director gets there and says, I want that cue to be louder. I've already, you know, if I've gone way over my limit here at zero dB, then I've, I've, I've compromised the whole track. So you want to be leaving at least six to eight, minus six to eight, 8 dB of headroom on the master. You'll notice that it's, it's very, very low if I just play the track for you here. I'll stretch this out. You know, I don't even come close to 12. And most of the instruments are here. If I fast forward, oh, here we go. Coming up to minus 6. And 
not even coming close to this area here. So we still have a lot of dynamics, which is what you want, okay? Next, um, this says strings, but that's only because I duplicated this track. What I have here is uh, some woodwinds. So if we listen to these, I'll solo them. And these are coming from the same notes, the same triads as the strings up here. It's just following that melody. So watch, watch. I'll play the, the piano underneath. Here we go. Now I've frozen these woodwinds down and bounced them down into audio, but they came from the same place that the strings above here do, and they came from a library called Capriccio by Sonokinetic. It's a phrase library. I don't like phrase libraries that much, but I like this one uh, because it has some lovely, you know, sort of um, phrase menus. It's really elegantly designed, easy to use, and. Uh, yeah, so let's look at the strings uh, setting here that I have. You'll see that I've got th one, two, three categories of phrases to, to choose from. I have some of them muted, so if I didn't have them muted, this is what it would sound like. Let's just solo this string section here. If I didn't have them muted. No, that's insane. Let's mute them. We're just going to use, it looks like two sort of bosoms, two arches, and that's a visual representation of what these phrases are doing. So if we hear them back, see we're going to kind of go up to the peak. It's going to crescendo and then come right back down. And I've just input my data in again here. Let's, let's hear this, uh, this grand piano. Same thing. Right, very simple. Oops. Okay, very simple stuff. Nothing too complicated. Um, I also, I've, I've done some work here in the settings to make sure, because what I can do is I can click on this little wheel and I can go in and mess about with the panning and the crossfading between um, notes when you're using this uh, library. The mics also, you can muck around with. The tuning, there's some fun harmonic shift stuff that you can do, but I've gone into these and I've tweaked them so that they're working with all the other instruments. Very important. You don't want anything overpowering anything else, especially with an orchestral sort of score. You want things to stand out in solo and then they fade kind of back into the background and then other things come about. It's it's it, things have to sort of work together. So that's what I've done here. I've done some some work on the volume and the panning and I've gone even further. Actually no, I haven't gone further with the um, the panning for this. I did with the uh, woodwinds, but not with this. I left it in the center and then I, I moved the panning here with this slider. A little bit to the right okay and these are all just subjective choices that I made now now that we've gone through all the instruments that I've used again very few really I mean the instruments themselves contain some uh, phrases and libraries that are made up of multi sampled instruments like strings and all this stuff but we're not seeing a huge you know this is as much as I have to scroll up and down we're not dealing with 80 90 100 tracks MIDI tracks okay the most important thing, once you've got your melody and everything else down, is to start doing some automation and start doing some EQing and panning things and putting them around the stereo image so that you're getting a mix that has depth and power and subtlety and all the rest of it. So one of the things that I do all the time is I slap a utility plugin. If we go to this right here, I've got this utility plugin. What are the most useful plugins in Ableton? Not a lot of people know about it. You can make things, you can, you know, suck out all the stereo width and make your tracks mono. You can bring about more stereo width. We'll just leave it at, I think it was at 100 before. 
But one of the coolest things I can do is I can manipulate the gain right here. So I've written some gain automation, and I'll show you what I mean by this. If I solo this, you can see this little fader moving around here. I've automated that. And then it goes down here. Right there. And I've done this. I mean, you'll see that it's rising here and then it goes down. That's because I've got the introduction of the strings up here. And I want these woodwinds, which I should just go ahead and call woodwinds right now. I want the woodwinds to kind of bow out a little bit when the strings come in, because otherwise they're going to kind of clash. So that's just what I've done. We've got them rising. And then they come down a little bit. So nothing's really clashing. And then even further in, they'll do more stuff, and I'll just fade them out eventually. So you might be asking yourself, well, why don't you just use the volume? Why don't you use the volume here um, on the woodwinds? Well, the reason I don't do that is because, let's say I did some volume automation right now. I'm going to hit this. I'm going to go to my... Um, where are we here? Woodwinds thing. I'm gonna automate the volume. Watch what watch what happens. I'll automate the volume instead. So let's record some automation in. And here come the strings. So let's say I like that, but I go to listen back to it. I want to make sure it catches the MIDI. And I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. Unsolo it. I'll say, oh my god, that sounds way too loud. Well, let me go down and just turn the, the volume down of the track, because now that I have everything else playing, it's not really working. So I'll go in, I'll be like, oh, I'll just I'll just turn this track down. Well, by turning it down, I'm, I've basically overridden all the MIDI, uh, the, all the automation that I've written in for it. And that's a problem, because the body of music, the sound, has dropped, and my automation is cancelled. So that's why I don't use... That's why I don't volumate the... Uh, volumate. That's why I don't automate the volume of anything, because it ruins the gain structure of everything else. So... I'm going to cancel this automation just by right-clicking Delete Automation. And I think I'm going to stick to my gain automation here, because what I can do is I can affect the gain here, and if I say, you know what, it's a bit too loud here, I can drag down this fader. And my automation stays exactly the same for the utility plugin. As it is, I want to turn it up a little bit. Okay. Now I've done that, especially on, on the Evo strings here, because whenever you have strings, I mean, I mean, if you listen back to this stuff here, remember the Evo strings before? It's just like a couple layers of notes, like I said, a curtain of strings. If anything is sort of constant, you want to add some vitality and movement to it, because otherwise it's going to sound very sustained and sort of boring. So I've done some automation here, not to make sure that it's not competing necessarily with all the other instruments, but just to give it some life. So watch this little fader move. That's just me having written in some automation with my push controller. I'm just going up and down just so it's not friggin' stale. I haven't done any automation here on the bottom one, because it's 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 kind of quiet and it's just giving us some low end, so I don't need to bump up low end per se. So then this goes up right here. Watch this. See, it comes up here, but it's going to go down a little bit 
to minus 2.73 dB when the strings come in. Can we just take it down a little bit? That's programmed. It's going to come down again over here. If I just skip to it. Okay, so by manipulating the volume and the structure of the gain, we can add dynamics and life into our cues and make it so that things aren't just on a level playing field, very boring and simple. That gets repetitive, and I think the ears get tired of that. So that's, you know, a very kind of brief overview of how I wrote this cue, the chords that I used, the instruments that I used. One more thing I want to point out is that I've always got this saturator on every MIDI plugin that I use. This comes from Ableton. You can find it in the audio effects. It's just down here. And I, I have this probably on every single track. Before, well, before I bounce these down, it was there, but it's there on Vocalize too. The saturator just gives, I don't know, just gives a bit of sparkle and life, I think, into all my tracks. So I've saved a, a, a preset, a default sort of folder for Ableton. So every time I open up Ableton, I've got a saturator and an EQ8 because I'm always going to reach for an EQ, but I'm, I've always got the saturator on. And maybe you can take a listen to what it sounds like when I turn it off and on. So these are the strings with the saturator. And without. I don't know, it just wakes it up a little bit. But not too much that I feel like I have to turn anything down. It just gives some body and sparkle to it. And I've got it set on here to Sinoid Fold. You'll probably get Analog Clip, which will be the first uh, the first preset here in the drop-down menu. I just have it on Sinoid, Sinoid Fold. I've got Color on, and I've just boosted it up here at about 100 kilohertz. The width, I've left the depth there. I don't want any bass. Um, and I've turned the dry, the dry wet knobs to 100%. Okay. And that just gives it some edge, because there everything's some edge. So hopefully what this video shows you is that you can make stuff on your own. You don't have to break the bank with millions of plugins and sample libraries. If you've noticed, I'm not using any really any plugins on these things. I'm using native Ableton stuff. And you know, there's nothing from nothing against these companies, but there's nothing from Isotope or UAD or any of that stuff. It's all stuff in the box. Um, the sample libraries, however, are a little pricey and all the rest of it. But I want my strings to sound good, and I want my tones to sound good. But when it comes to adding stuff in the mixing stage, it's a very very light setup, and that's just because less is more. As I said before, if there's anything you want to ask me um, that I, did, I didn't explain in this. Uh, this setup, just please let me know. Um, I'm going to leave some links in the description where you can find out more about the movie, which I highly suggest you check out when it's finally done. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. Take it easy.